of capital round accounting and auditing. He is working with, uh, he is working in UAE from last 10 years almost. And uh, he has extensive, almost 20 years overall experience in Pakistan and in UAE. He is diversified professional. He's a seasoned and learned professional. He has provided many trainings and courses in different organizations, universities, and he remains as faculty member in ICM in Pakistan as well. Uh, today, would like to invite him. He's member of UAE branch council as well. And he is always a big sport for ICMA members and for ICMA itself. When we talk about the registration of ICMA Pakistan in UAE, he played an instrumental role for this registration. So I would like to request him, sir, please uh, today, I'll, oh, now it's over to you and we are, we are hoping for the best and let's hope, le let's learn from him about the economic substance regulations and UBO. What is perspective in UAE perspective he will share and Pakistan perspective will be shared by the Shadal Khan. Thank you very much. Over to you, Malik Khalid Mahmoud, FCMA. Thank you, Mr. Kamal, for explaining the whole situation and uh, introducing Mr. Malik Khan. Malik, Malik Sahib, uh, your voice is not clear. Can you hear Now it's okay? Yeah, now it's okay, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Kamar, for explaining the overall situation and introducing me as well. So I will save my time again reintroducing. Let's coming to the specific point uh, uh, on ESR, the economic substance regulations. I will be very specific and to the point to give you more and maximum practical knowledge. We are practically working on the same scenario and give you the practical aspects of each and everything. Uh, the UE, when it becomes the part of the OECD, so, one second. They, they implemented the ESR in UE. What is basically the ESR? ESR basically is the economic substance regulation the purpose of ESR, why it is implemented in UE, the purpose of the ESR was to ensure that UE entities undertaken certain activities. What are the certain activities? I will let you know. Report actual profits means no one will be having the chance to hide their profits and expenditures that are commensurate with the economic activity undertaken in the UE. What are the relevant and certain activities are? The relevant activities are banking, insurance, investment fund management, lease finance, headquarters, shipping businesses, holding companies, intellectual properties, distribution and service center business. So now I will give you a brief overview on all of the activities. Most of you are well aware the banking businesses day to day you are uh, going to the bank and operating your transaction. The banking business with specific to raising funds, managing risk, including credit, currency, and inherent risk, taking their hedging position, providing loans, credit, or other financial services to customers, managing capital, preparing reports to investors, or any government authority with the functions relating to supervision or regulations of basic businesses. I mean, all banks who are doing this banking businesses, they must have to notify the authority and assessing authority also have to provide the reports. Means all the activities which I will explain now, they, they have to notify the authority and also submit the ESR reports. Next is insurance businesses. Insurance businesses predicting and calculating the risks insuring and reinsuring against risk and providing insurance business services to the clients, underwriting insurance and reinsurance. The third one is the investment management business, taking decisions on holding and selling of investments, means on behalf of their customers, calculating risk and reserves, taking decisions on currency, 
or interest fluctuations and hedging positions. Preparing reports to investors or any government authority with the functions relating to the supervision or regulation, regulation of such businesses. Fourth one is lease finance. Lease finance, they are taking their decisions on holding and selling of investments, calculating risk and reserves, taking decisions on currency or interest fluctuations and hedging position. They are preparing report to investors and government authority with a function relating to supervision and regulation of such businesses. Headquarter businesses. Headquarter businesses, they have several organization inside in their portfolio. They are taking relevant management decision for them. Either they are in the country or out of country or they are in multinational positions. Incoming operating expenses on behalf of group entities coordinating group activities. So these businesses also will come under ESR. Shipping businesses. Shipping businesses, they are the one who are managing their queues. They are hiring and firing their payments and overseeing crew members, overhauling and maintaining the ships, overseeing and tracking the shipping businesses, determining what goods to be ordered and when to order them, when to deliver them, organizing and overseeing the complete voyages, the complete shipping businesses. Holding companies. Holding companies basically is a license which only holds equity interest in different companies. And against this equity interest, the interest, they are receiving dividends and while selling them, they are receiving the gains. If a UE activity undertakes any other commercial equity, please note here, the, if the holding company is only holds the shares for receiving of dividends and gains, then they are a holding company. If UE entity, undertakes any commercial activity or earns any other forms of income, it cannot be a holding company businesses. While the holding of such other assets are the performance of any commercial activities constitute a different relevant activity, that is a lease finance businesses. The UE entity would be subject to economic substance regulation in respect of other relevant activity. Intellectual property business, where the intellectual property asset is patent or similar, similar intellectual property assets in which research and development, marketing, intangible or similar intellectual property assets, branding, marketing and distribution. In exceptional cases, where the licensee is a high risk IP license, high risk IP license, the core income generating activities may include taking decisions and managing as well as bearing the principal risk related to the development and subsequent exploitation of intangible asset generating income. Taking the strategic decisions and managing as well as bearing the principal risk relating to the acquisition by third parties and subsequent exploitation and protection of the intangible assets. Carrying on any ancillary trading activities through which the intangible assets are exploited relating to the generation of income from third parties. What are the conditions of high risk business? The, here the important things they are putting on high risk businesses, why they are different from other businesses. The licensee did not create the IP assets, which it hold for the purposes of its business. Why? The license was acquired the IP asset for either from connected person or in consideration for funding research and development by another person situated in another country other than UE. The licensee licenses the IP assets to one or more connected persons or otherwise generates income from the assets in subsequent of activities performed by foreign connected persons. Distribution and service business, transporting and sorting, storing component parts, material or good ready for sales, managing inventories, taking orders, providing consulting or other administrative services. Here I will explain something. Most of the people are confused that distribution, if it is distribution business, they are coming in ESR regulation, no. They are doing service business, they are coming in ESR regulation, no. Here, the meaning of distribution and service center business means 
the peoples who are connected to a foreign entity, I mean, their head offices are in different country, USA, UK, or other countries, and they are receiving the goods for the purpose of delivering in UE through connected persons. I mean, the prices for the purchase they are receiving is fixed by from their head office or from their parent companies. So they are coming under this ESR regulation. It's same activity with the service center businesses who are connected with the foreign partners. I mean, the main concern of the businesses outside of UE, they are coming under distribution and service center business. The normal distribution companies or service center com companies are not coming under this ESR regulation for reporting purpose. Reporting periods, I mean, if your financial period ends on January 1st, I mean, this ESR, basically reporting of this ER purpose is, means any company who, who is formed or who has commenced his business on 1st January 2019, they are coming under this ESR regulations. And their financial period ends on, if, they, if their financial period ends on 31st December, their not, ESR notifications will be submitted by 31st January 2021. Normally, the reporting period for the ESR notification is six months. Within six months of the closure of financial period, you have to submit your ESR notification and ESR report also will be submitted within one year. So let's say your financial period is next financial year commencing on 1st January 2020. So you are supposed to submit your ESR notification on June 30, 2021. And your ESR report will go 31 December 2021. If your financial period commences on I mean, 1st January of 2021, or if your financial period starts from 1st April 2020 and your financial e period ends on 31st March 2021. So within six months means you have to submit your ESR notification, which should be subject to September 30, 2022. And your ESR report will be go 31st December 2022. And the companies who are regulated, let's say the company have started their financial period on 1st July 2018 and their financial period ends on 30th June 2019. So do they have to submit the notification or and the report? No. The ESR specifically mentioning the companies who have started or commenced the business on 1st January 2019. The companies who have started earlier, I mean, their financial period starts from 1st July 2018 and end in 30th June 2019, they are not supposed to submit the notification or the report. So who have to submit the notification and who have to submit the report, how we will come to know? The ministry have specifically given a slab, I means you can say a, a given us a specific document which will give you and notify you means how you will come and check your test. This is called ESR tests, I mean economic substance test. So if you are falling in this test, then you are supposed to submit the notification and the report. So what is this test? Is the licensee a corporate body? I mean, if you are a limited, li limited liability company, if you are a public service company, if you are a private service company, I mean, then you are, I mean, you can say, yes, you are going down. If you say, no, you are not entitled to the regulation. I mean, if you are sole proprietorship, you are not coming under this regulations. So if you say, yes, you will go down. So in next, does the licensee conduct a relevant activity? No. So regulation does not apply to you. If you say yes, if you say no, I mean regulation will not apply to you, but you are required to file a notification. So then secondly, if you are under yes, if the licensee is an exempt company, I will the next I will explain you what is exempt company. If you are exempt company, yes, no requirement to demonstrate substance in the UE no requirement to demonstrate substance in the UE. If say no, we'll go to next. Does the licensee earn income from relevant activity? If you say no, so no requirement to demonstrate substance in the UE for the financial year. If you say yes, then you are required to 
submit the ESR report as well within 12 months after the end of the financial year. Is the relevant activity is a holding business? If you say no, we'll go to next. If yes, 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 the, does the licensee, if we're right, right now we'll go on yes side, does the licensee meet the compliance requirement from its regulatory authority? Yes. Does the licensee have adequate compliance on premises? Yes. Licensee meets the UE economic substance requirement. So he is required to submit the notification and file the ESR report as well. So while coming to the no, I mean, is the licensee a high risk IP license? If you say yes, then there will be automat automatically exchange of information with your foreign competent authority. Means the information which you will submit, it will not only be in UE, it will go to foreign countries wherever you belongs to. Then is the licensee directed and managed in the UE? Does the licensee have had adequate, um, adequate employees, means sufficient number of employees, expenditures, and physical assets held in the UE? Does the licensee perform the core income generating activities in the UE? Yes. Licensee meets the economic substance requirement. If you say mean no, then licensee, mean if you say no, then the licensee is subject to exchange of information with the foreign competent authorities, including penalties. So now we'll go to back our main concern. Here I will mention that the relevant activities have reporting to their relevant authorities, which are here. I mean, if you are intellectual property business, means not only Ministry of Economy, there are other two authorities as well, like Financial Free Zone and the other intellectual property authority, which you will have to report it. Besides all of these authorities, there is National Assessing Authority. The National Assessing Authority is FTA. The Federal Taxation Authority has become the National Assessing Authority, which will assess your business and even send you the notification Whatever, whatever the information as and when required by the authorities, national assessing authorities, regulatory authorities, you must have to submit. Banking businesses, they are their regulators are UE Central Bank. If they are in uh, falling in the free zones, so in free zones also will be their competent authority to ask them the information. Insurance businesses, insurance business is the insurance authority which is controlling the insurance companies. If they are in free zone, the free zones authorities can also ask them the information. Besides these two authorities, the National Assessing Authority, which is FTA, can also ask the and inquire the information from you. Investment fund managers. They have securities and commodity authority and other competent authorities of the free zone, DIFC. And if they are in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi authorities can also ask them. The headquarter businesses is the main license is issued from the Ministry of Economy. And if they are in the free zone, the free zone authorities can also inquire the information from you. The shipping businesses, Ministry of Economy, if they are in free zone, the relevant free zone authorities as well. Bes in beside these two authorities, the National Assessing Authority, FTA, can also inquire the information from you. Holding company business, Ministry of Economy, and same, the financial free zone, intellectual property business, Ministry of Economy, and the free zones, distribution service center business. Whenever, as and when, the authority asks you the information you must have to provide. If by chance you don't provide, you have to face the penalties and other actions, which I will explain in the next section. So the companies who are exempt, means there are some companies, the government have said they are exempt from the ESR and even the Ministry of Finance or the Minister of Finance declare any company or any sector, it will be exempt from the ESR. A licensee that is a tax resident outside UE means with this, with the implementation of VAT and ESR, every company is obtaining the domicile. Domicile means the companies 
where will be the resident for the tax purposes if the company if the licensee is tax resident outside of ue this law will not be applicable to them investment fund and its underlying spvs investment holding entities a wholly owned ue resident business that is not a part of multinational group and only carries on activities in the ue a wholly owned means 100% owned it means a sole proprietorship a branch of a foreign entity that is subject to tax on all of its relevant income in a foreign jurisdiction us based uk based pakistan based any other licensee at the discretion of the minister of finance minister of finance can declare any company which will be exempt from submission or notification of the esr next is a uh, offenses and penalties means right now if we don't have the information or if we are rigid to the information we will say we will see what will happen and what will not happen if we are falling under the test and we don't notify the authority we are supposed to receive a fine of 20000 dirham and this fine need to be deposited within 30 days to the authority and if we are not submitting the esr report we will have a fine of 50000 dirham and I mean continuously second year all we said okay they have given fine and we have not received it we are unaware of it but fines will be imposed in the subsequent year I mean the next year we are also not filing the notification and if required the esr report we are not submitting it. we have a fine of 400000 and everybody aware when the fines are there you cannot leave the country you must have to pay this and if we are submitting the esr report we are filing the notification we are submitting the wrong information or inaccurate information we are supposed to receive another fine which is 50000 dirham please take care of this one then the authority I mean national assessing authority is a fta who is also the authority of the tax vat value added tax the authority its officials and its employees have the authority and the power I mean for vat purposes they are sending you the notice for 5 days before here they can enter in your promises and examine the documents any authorized personnel of the regulatory authority or national assessing authority may examine and take copies of the business documents that is in your business premises during official working hours the important thing to note here official working hours they cannot come to you after official working hours the power of the regulatory authority and national authority may exercise only for the purpose of administrative investigation conducted to ensure mean it doesn't means that every business they are entering and taking the documents no only the companies who have the issues who have the problem and they are under administrative investigation then the authority personnel are coming they are not going to any other businesses next what is the purpose of this uh, means uh, esr means what is the purpose of this no notification I mean the, the licensee and I mean esr's notification the licensee and their activities in the ue for relevant reportable period and for esr report licensee and means to know the exact and correct income expenditure assets employees and government related to its and governors related to its relevant activities in the ue who needs to submit the notify notification and esr report means everyone who is falling under the test must be filed if you are a corporate entity that's a limited liability company public joint stock company private joint stock company or a partnership who is a limited liability partnership or a general partnership that undertakes any of the relevant activities the report must be filed by a corporate entity that is a limited liability company public joint stock company private joint stock company or a partnership a limited liability that is not an exempted license and that derives relevant income from the following activities what is esr notification and what is esr report we will see in just after this slide I mean how should the esr be filed I mean i we have to submit on any paper or on any letter no 
it will be submitted electronically on the ministry of finance portal electronically on the ministry of finance portal and notification and report both will be electronically submitted what if the licensee is the process of liquidation means you are going to close the company you are decided to discontinue your business so who will submit your notification you can submit yourself your notification or the main responsibility will be the liquidator if the licensee undertakes relevant activity in the year of liquidation the liquidator will must ensure to satisfy the requirements of the authority they have to submit the notification and they are responsible for the submission of the esr report now we will see what is the esr notification and how it is to be filed and what information is required and what is the esr report what are the parts of this what information is required to be submitted in the esr report so while coming to the notification notification will be look like this licensee details first will be the name of your business as per your trade license then the next question will be does the licensee have a dual license and if you are holding multiple licenses you have to give the details here and the commercial license number the licensing authority who have issued you the license it's the ministry of economy i have heard the free zone you have to mention here main regulatory authority if you have multiple purposes multiple licenses to more than one licenses to you have to mention here who is your main regulator of the license place of establishment is where dubai abu dhabi or wherever registered office address registered office address which is mentioned on your trade license registered office city dubai sharjah abu dhabi whatever it is registered office country united definitely united arab emirates legal form you are a limited limited company public giant star company or whatever it is the next question which it will be is the licensee registered for the vat purposes in the ue if you say yes then you are supposed to give the vat number as well it's a 15 digit number which you have to give then branch details I mean if you have more than one branches so you have to give the branches details here here the question arises do we have to submit the notification of each branch and submit the report of each branch no a consolidated form of notification and consolidated form of esr report will be submitted by one company with all of their branches if you are holding different type of licenses with different activities then for each of your license you have to submit your notification and the esr report but if you have the branches consolidated report of your branches will be submitted here if you are consolidated mean you made a group for vat purposes this doesn't means that you will submit one report and one notification for all of your group no each of your license will be differently and separately submit will submit the notification and the report but if you have branches yes you can submit the consolidated report of all of your branches their license number and trading license details here as explained earlier the reportable period mean if this law has commenced from 1st january 2019 any company who is formed on 1st january 2019 or after is required to submit the notification and the report so in easy language if your company financially ends in 31st december so within 6 months you are supposed or if it's end in 31st march if ends on 30th june within 6 months you have to submit your notification and within one year of your end of your financial year you are supposed to submit the esr report to the financial assessing authority if your business is commenced before means your licensee have incorporated business on 1st july 2018 and ends on 30th june 2019 financial year so you have incorporated your business before the esr implementation so you are not supposed to submit the esr notification and report for this relevant period but after that you are supposed to submit notification and the report so start date will be if your financial period starts from 1st january 2019 so you will say 1st january 2019 here end date will be 31st december 
2019. So for the first notification period, they have extend after extension, you are supposed to you were supposed to submit 31st January 2021. So once you will finish this requirement, then the question will come relevant activities. So here the question will be yes or no. I mean the answer will be yes or no. Question will be you are performing a relevant activity. If you say no, so this window will not appear to you, which is you are looking now. So if you say yes, then they will ask you which relevant activity, business, banking, insurance, business, investment, fund management, and so on. So you have to select one of them. Once you will select one of them, so next will be your relevant activity details. I mean, if the answer is no, means you are not coming here. If the answer is yes, did, did, did your answer is no to all the applicable activities in the question B? So you have to say yes or no. If selected intellectual property business in question two, then they will ask you another question. Is this is a high risk IP? Again, high risk IP, which you are working for other purpose, not for your own business. So it's owned by, and next, as I explained earlier by someone, then high risk business also. So you will select yeah, yes or no here. So coming to the next page, exemptions. Please confirm. I mean, if you are meeting the exemption license requirement or no, yes or no here. Then there will be other options. If you are confirming yes, confirm the license is wholly owned UE national or UE tax residents. I mean, then you have to select all of these relevant options which are belonging to you. Coming to the next, the parent company, the ownership of the parent company, you have to give the tax identification details here. Okay, UBO, which I'll explain later. What is UBO? Means you have to give the UBO details here, the name, tax identification number, address, and country of residence as well. I mean, after means once you fill up the UBO and the ownership of the companies, then will become the declaration. The declaration will be submitted by the owner or your general manager, managing director, CEO, who is responsible and who can assessing authority can means contact by email by call or can issue the notices on it so this this is the notification the notification ends on once you will submit the notification the second stage automatically will appear to submit the esr report the esr report will looks like this it will be starting in the same notification pages also will come once you will submit the ESR notification, you will get ESR registration number. You have to fill up here. Then licensee name. Licensee have been same questions of uh, the notification will come. You will cross all of these questions. If you have submitted already the questions, they will be populated here. But here also make sure you cannot amend this one. The same information which you have submitted the notification, the same information should be populated here. So while crossing this notification details, reportable period. So next question will be <clears throat> audited financial statements. You are supposed to attach as an attachment the audited financial statements. If you don't have audited financial statement, you will say no. By selecting no doesn't mean you are exempt from this. You are supposed to attach the management accounts which you have made in-house accounts. Then the currency which you are using for your financials is whatever it's UE dirhams or it's a USD. Then the total revenue of the licensee in the reportable period, accounting profits or losses, net book value of intangible assets. Please make sure that you are giving the correct information why they are asking you correct information and they are giving the fines of inaccurate income because after the announcement of VAT in UE, all of your bank information, the VAT, uh, the FTA can extract it. They have all of your information. They are connected to customs and through banks. All of information, they already have it. So this will be verified here. If you don't submit the correct information, you are definitely supposed to get a fine. So relevant activity information. Now you are going to select which activity was your this. 
and then you have to select which regulatory authority you are going to submit means minister of economy and whatever the activities we have seen before and their authorities then the relevant activity which activity you have it so if you have high p high risk ip then you have another questions also coming on so then if it is a if it's a banking business now it will come activity wise once you will select your activity your next question will be only to your relevant activity in this template only i will explain all activities but in your practically I mean online once you are submitting your only relevant activity questions will appear to you and you have to give them the answer banking business relevant income their operating expenditures average number of employees what do you mean by average number of employees I mean if you have in the year end 10 employees at the start you are having 12 employees so one employee left in june and the other in july so you will take average so at the end you have base practically 10 but every number of employee will be 11 12 or 13 uh, whatever the proportion i mean if the employee have worked for 3 months so in 3 months also you have to take the average if your employee have worked 9 months and one 3 months so it means from the two you will take one employee and as an average so you have to mention here then the core generating activities raising funds means uh, whatever their uh, relevant uh, portion is coming here you have to select then expenditures accounting profit and losses total value of deposits held in the ue and so on so insurance businesses also relevant income from insurance businesses their operating expenditure average of full time of employees their core generating revenues in what are the options you can select here you can come up then investment fund managers business their relevant incomes expenditures average number of employees and I mean again i'm telling you what once you will select your activity the relevant questions of your activity will be asked to you here only for presentation purposes we are just explaining this one so lease finance businesses relevant income of lease finance business operating expenditures and so on your next options you will select it's a group company third party means all the relevant details you will fill up here so lease finance business once ends so we'll come to headquarters businesses relevant income of headquarters operating expenditures average number of their full time employees see they are taking relevant management decision they are again asking you so you have to keep the information correct shipping businesses anyone have any relevant question they can ask me i will be able to answer all of them so intellectual property businesses the main concern is high risk because the more monies are coming in and going out from this businesses so again the expenditures counting profits their assets held and registered in the ue or not if not in ue which country they are registered see in high pay risk ip risk businesses they have some additional information the business plan showing the reasons for holding the ownership of the icp in the ue then employees information including the level of experience their qualification and type of duration of employment with the licensee evidence that all relevant decision making take place within Ma the malik sir uh, one second sorry to interrupt uh, uh, your relevant slide is not showing really yeah we are stuck at the slide number 18 oh no okay what i will do because all activities are mostly for companies different but uh, their main activities are same i will come up the report just to show quickly
So notification also is covering here. I mean, basically, once you will submit your notification, your ESR number will come here. Your license name. If you are have a dual license or multiple licenses, you will select here. Again, I will explain here. If you have multiple, I mean, if you are formed as a group for VAT purposes, so it doesn't means that you will be a group here. You have to submit the report and notification of each of your license. But if you have a main license and you are operating the same under branches, so all of your branches details, you will be combined and consolidated information will be submitted here. Uh, come on, I hope we are looking the same slide on the yes, report. No, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. Yes. And it I mean the same commercial license number will be here. The licensing authority. If you for your main relevant activities, your place of establishment, your address, your city, registered country, office, and legal forms of the business. So then general information, if you are registered for VAT, you will say yes, and you have to feed up your 15 digit VAT number. Is the licensee part of a multinational group? Your answer will be yes or no. I mean, is the licensee is wholly owned government entities? If any entry go owned by government entities, so it means they will they are exempt from this notification. Then your branch details. See, all of your branches you have to consolidate. A consolidated report will be submitted here. Then the reportable periods. Reportable period you will mention here. Let's say first January 2019 and 31st December 2020. Then the updated information. I mean here, yes, no. Financial information you have audited. If you have audited, yes. If you are selecting yes, it means in, in with, within this report, you have to attach the audited accounts as well. If you don't have audited financial, say no and submit your management reports or in house accounts. You have to select the currency and the total revenue of the license for the reportable period. So please insert the correct and 100% accurate information. If you will not submit, you are supposed to receive 50,000 dirham as a fine. On the introduction of VAT, the government means that for the assessing authority, federal taxation, FTA, have the access all of your bank statements and all of your information. Wherever you are buying the goods, selling the goods, they have the information. While you are importing in the country or exporting in the country, they have the information. So most of the information, they have it. So make sure you are as giving the exact and accurate information, total revenue, accounting profits and net book values. Basically the main multinational companies, you know what they were doing it means, I mean, they were hiding the prices all over the world. So relevant businesses, once you will select banking business, again, I'm mentioning here, if you select banking business, you will receive the question only for relevant to your banking business. If you select insurance businesses and the insurance authority, here you will mention it. So you will receive only the questions regarding to your insurance business. Here, just for the presentation purposes, we are showing here all the information, which is even not relevant to your business. So relevant information activity, relevant questions, same banking business, their relevant financial information, insurance business, their relevant information, revenue expenditures, and every number of employees. As I explained earlier, so I'm just skipping up. Any questions you can just write up. We will be able to explain to you. So this is your report. Make sure you are submitting your report within a time framework. If you have submitted your notification, you have mistakes in your notification, you can correct your notification again. If you have mistakes in your report, you can submit the report again, amend it but make sure you are submitting the correct information your notification and your report have should have the similar information ubo here they are asking your ultimate beneficial owner as well i will explain now the benefit ubo is what So let me install this. Now we'll come on the UBO. What is UBO? 
UBO basically is your ultimate beneficial owner. So ultimate beneficial owners means mean the person who is mean who, who who actually owns your business. If he don't owns your business, it means he controls your business. So what was the need of UBO? What was the need of ultimate beneficial owners? I mean, most of the organizations, the companies get work from their employees. When any problem will come, they will say, okay, my employees have did, we don't know about this one. So to get the exact information from the companies and come to know who is actually owning the company and who is the owner and who is the beneficial, best beneficial owner, who is the beneficiary, so the government have introduced UBO to contribute to the development of business environment, capacities of the state, and its economic position in accordance with the international requirements by regulating the minimum obligation of the registrar. The registrar is also responsible for the UBO and legal persons in the state, including the licensing and registration procedures, regulating the register of beneficial owners and register of partners or shareholders. So what is the scope of this application? The UBO is applicable on the registrar, licensed or registered legal persons in the state, the commercial free zones. These three persons are responsible to maintain the UBO and their registers. Where this law does not apply, any company who is wholly owned by the local government, federal government, or any companies who are wholly owned by such companies are financial free zones. I mean, the government companies are not coming under the UBO. Who is UBO? A UBO is an individual who is ultimately owning and controlling the entity or on whose behalf the transactions or activities are taking place. Even the employees are performing the transaction, but on behalf of the ultimate beneficial owner. So for a company, who is the means beneficial owner? Who is the UBO? A UBO is an individual who owns or controls 25% or more shares or voting rights, ultimately owns or controls, whether directly or indirectly. He has given any power of money to someone, 25% or more of the shares or voting rights in the business holds the rights directly or indirectly to I mean he has the powers he has the authority he can directly or indirectly appoint or remove majority of the board of directors he has the right he has the power to exercise or actually exercises significantly significantly influence or control over the corporate body he exercises ultimate control over the management he controls the corporate body. So he's the in UBO. Then if the shares are rights held by a nomino, nominee, the UBO will be the person for whom the nominee is acting. If the nominee is acting for a legal entity, means now the it's a, means the company who have a main office in other country, so they have opened the branch. So here the own mean the main company is the UBO basically. So now who is the running here? The UBO will be the person for whom the nominee is acting. If the nominee is acting for a legal entity, then the UBO will be the person who exercises the ultimate control over the legal entity. Like ICMAP is established in Pakistan. They have branch in Rock, Rocky is Rasul Ras Khaimah. So who will be the ultimate beneficial owner? Our ED, our executive director, because he has the authority to exercise his powers and regulations. For a partnership firm, a UBO is an individual who owns, who controls 25% or more of the capital of the partnership, or who ultimately is entitled to control 25% or more of the voting rights of the partnership. For a trust, there will be different people who will be the UBO. It will be the settler who is settling the matter, the trustee, the beneficiaries, and any individual who has a control over the trust. Now, it's legally required to maintain the register of the beneficial owner. And the data cannot be manipulated. It cannot be deleted. 
the legal person shall keep and maintain the data of each beneficial owner in the register of beneficial owner to be established within 60 days from the date of promulgation of this decision or the date on which the legal person comes into existence. The legal person shall update and record any changes to the data contained in the register of the beneficial order within 15 days of becoming aware of such change. What are the details which are required to be entered in the register? Full name, nationality, date and place of birth, residential addresses or the address where the notices shall be sent on it by virtue of this decision. The number of the passport and it should be the renewed passport, it should not be the expired passport or the identity card, country of issuance date of issuance and expiry, basis and date on which the person become the beneficial owner of the legal person, date on which the person sees to the beneficial owner of the legal person, mean if the beneficial owners are changing, you have to update their records. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Kamar. From my side, now we'll move to the Pakistani official who will give you the overview of the UBO. Well, thank you, Malsa. Can you please uh, close uh, your presentation? Stop yes, sharing. Yes. yes, done. Well, thank you very much for a great uh, presentation. And you gave us a lot of knowledge today. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through it, this ESR and uh, UBO uh, filing in UAE. Uh, before I go to the Shahzad Afzal Khan, there are uh, two or three questions related to. So can I ask yes. these questions? Yes, uh, please. Mr. Mahtab Ahtar, he's saying our company offices in Abu Dhabi and, no, and there is no other branch. Business is transport. We are doing transportation business. Do we need to file ESR? See, they are means are we eligible for ESR reporting? It's saying. See, yeah. this if there is one test which I already mean explained earlier. I mean, this is a transportation business. If this business is in UE, you need to see this company is owned by hundred percent by one individual. If it is a sole proprietorship, you are not supposed to submit even the notification. Report is second thing. But if it is an LLC company, like limited liability company. So you are not falling in the relevant activities, but you have to submit only the notification. No report will be required. Okay, right. There is another question. If we are on mainland company, licensing authority, Sharjah Economic or Dubai Economic Department is not mentioned. So what, how to file that Yes, in that case? No, no, it's mentioned. I will just go again on a slide where the notification was there. So I'm allowed to share the screen? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. So see under this one, first topic, I mean name of the license, does the license here, dual license, after that the commercial license number and issuing authority. Once you are reaching here, you have to select the issuing authority. It's a Sharjah Economic Development Authority or it's Dubai, means a Dubai a DED who have issued, you have to select here. Means all of the issuing authorities who have issued a license, they are coming here. So you have to select it. Even if you have multiple licenses, the main license also you have to select it. It's a Sharjah Economic Zone, it's a Sharjah DED or it's a Dubai DED, you have to select it from here. Even the place of establishment, you have to select here the city. You cannot type it, you have to select it. Dubai, Sharjah, or Abu Dhabi. And definitely it's coming. All right, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, some, uh, some of the participants are asking they couldn't attend since the start of this presentation. So can okay. we share this presentation with the participants? Yes, of course. Of course, anyone okay. can. So we'll send this presentation to ICMA Pakistan. Anyone who needs this presentation can contact directly to members department and they can share with the participants of this uh, program. Thank you very much, Malik Thank you for your time, for sparing the time, for preparing this presentation. 
and you know sharing the knowledge with the people and with the members and students of icm in pakistan thank you so much thank you thank you now our next speaker is uh, mr shahzad afzal khan mr shahzad afzal khan can i request you please to uh, turn on your video so i can spotlight you over here yeah well thank you very much thank you very much mr shahzad afzal khan is an additional director at security and exchange commission of pakistan he is a fellow member of institute of cost and management accounts of pakistan he has over 22 years diversified experience with law and regulators and he is a you know a trainer at, uh, at institute of cost and management accounts of pakistan for director training programs he is a frequent trainer and providing different training activities i would like to welcome him for our today program this is he will give the perspective from pakistan point of view before we were learning about the ue point of view uh, perspective now we will learn about pakistan perspective sir thank you very much for joining and over to you your mic is mute can you please unmute your mic Thank you, Kamal. That was a gracious introduction. I'm so glad and uh, very happy to be part of this training program. And it was very wonderful presentation by Mr. Khalid Mahmood. Uh, uh, we have learned truly in in very um, uh, true sense what we have achieved, uh, especially for Bio. My focus will remain on the Pakistani regime as we have recently introduced the. Uh, a regime regarding the beneficial ownership and i'll focus on uh, basically that why pakistan has introduced this regime and what led us do that and and what are the other covenants what what needs to be understood in in context of beneficial ownership so if my presentation is uh, um, am i audible to everyone and my presentation is shared at screen if anyone can confirm please Yes, sir. We can Thank view you. your presentation and your audible. Okay, so this all happened uh, because of the FATF. Actually, Pakistan had to introduce this regime uh, uh, with regard to the beneficial owner in the corporate registry. And as my friend Khalid has just told that in, in UAE, the registrar is required to maintain the uh, uh, the beneficial ownership record and uh, simultaneously the license entity also have to maintain the bio record. Uh, I'll just tell you the perspective of uh, uh, FATF as uh, I have been working as the head of department of anti-money laundering in Securities Exchange Commission of Pakistan. So uh, I'm dealing with them directly one-on-one -on -one and also heading the leading effort with regard to immediate outcome five, which is pertaining to transparency and legal beneficial ownership. This uh, immediate outcome, as you, as everyone knows that FATF has two covenants to its uh, methodology. The first is the technical compliance comprising of 40 standards. And then we have the effectiveness, which comprises of 11 immediate outcomes. This is the immediate outcome five. Uh, which deals with legal person and legal arrangements and uh, relates primarily to the uh, beneficial ownership and transparency. We all know that FATF is a financial action task force. So everything which is uh, dealing with the finance is actually the subject matter of FATF. And here they want that a any legal person or legal arrangement, whosoever it is, when deal, while making or establishing a business relationship with any financial institution or DNFPP, therein they are required to display their ownership, not only their first line ownership, but also the beneficial ownership. With regard to legal person and legal arrangement, the basic a purpose is preventing from misuse of money laundering and terrorist financing financing and information on their beneficial ownership is available to the competent authority without impediment now these are the competent authorities actually which are investigating the money laundering and terrorist financing uh, um, offenses so in pakistan there are only four agencies which are which are uh, de designated as the investigating agency they are they are fp they are fpr 
then uh, Anti-Narcotics Force, ANF, then it is National Accountability Bureau, and finally it is FIA. So these are the only four entities which have been designated as the investigating authorities, and, and FATF wants that any country who, uh, wherein the investigating authorities are investigating the cases of money laundering or terrorist financing, then they immediately they are exposed to, or whenever they require, they need, they are no impediment to reach to the beneficial owner of the legal person or the legal arrangement. So it is uh, the technique on the technical compliance. It is FATF's recommendation 24, which is the uh, which is pertaining to uh, this transparency and uh, beneficial ownership, and it also deals with uh, the underlying requirements of the uh, of this uh, uh, beneficial ownership. So. Now, if I, I country, uh, now exactly what it says, it says that country should take measures to prevent the misuse of legal person from money laundering or terrorist financing. Countries should ensure that there is ad adequate, accurate, and timely information. These are very crucial words, adequate, accurate, and timely information on the beneficial ownership and control of the legal person that can be obtained or assessed in a timely fashion by competent authorities. In particular, countries that have legal person that are able to use, now that this is the other component of it, that they want that if you have a regime of bearer share or bearer share want warrants, then that needs also be taken care of so that we know who the person was holding or, or who's actually owning these bearer share. So they, they also suggest a, a regime for that. Beside this recommendation 24, they also put a burden on the financial institution and on DNFPPs under recommendation 10 and recommendation 22, that whenever these legal person, or when we will discuss in later our style with the legal arrangement, then these financial institution and DNFPP also understands and know that who are they dealing with? And that is why this custom, know your customer regime is in place. So this is an imperative requirement that whenever FI is making a relationship and you all accountants as DNFPP, you know, in Pakistan, we have this designated non-financial businesses and profession and our part comes into this part of profession that P, which is in DNFPP, uh, we are uh, accountants and fall under the regime of ICMAP, uh, who is the actually a SRB, this is self-regulatory body of the accountants. And therein, there are certain criteria on which one, uh, accountants while dealing certain transactions, they need also they also need to carry out customer due diligence of their customer, and at that point in time, they are also required to understand that who the legal who the beneficial owner of that legal person is. So, in terms of legal arrangement, the requirements are that country should take measure to prevent the misuse of legal arrangement for money laundering or terrorist financing. In particular, country should ensure that there is adequate, accurate, and timely, adequate, accurate, and timely uh, information on ex express trust, including information on settler, trustee, and beneficiary. This is exactly very close to the regime as explained earlier by my friend Khaled uh, in the UAE regime. This is exactly the requirements on the un identifying the BO of the settler, the BO of the trustee, and BO of the beneficiary that can be obtained or assessed in timely fashion by the competent authorities. Countries should consider measures to facilitate access to beneficial ownership and control information by financial institution and TNFPP. This is the soul of this requirement. All this 24 and 25 and IO5, they are actually not directly the subject matter of FATF, but they have put that in, put that in because they want that the BO uh, of the, uh, that the DNFPP immediately identify or FI immediately identify the beneficial owner. And that is why this whole regime has put into place. So in recommendation 10, we have just discussed that. And recommendation 22, uh, the DNFPP regulation, I was just telling you that when these accountants come into play, when they are on behalf of their client, on behalf of their client, buying and selling of real estate, managing of client money, security, or other asset, 
management of banks, savings, or security account, organization of contribution for the creation, operation, or management of companies, <clears throat> creating, operating, or management of legal person or legal arrangement, and buying and selling of business entity. Now, this is our part. This is our, us, the accountants, who have to carry out customer due diligence when they are doing such activities on behalf of their clients. So on one part, we are also uh, have to deal with this, but on other, we are just going to see that uh, where this requirement is contained, it is contained, uh, the number may not be the exactly same, but for the purposes of verification of identity of the customer or beneficial owner, uh, reliable and independent document data or sources or may include as applicable. So this, this is the requirement which is in the uh, uh, in the ICMAP regulation, wherein the BO is required to be identified by the accountant while entering into the services I explained in the earlier slide. Now, who is the beneficial owner? The beneficial owner refers to the natural person. This is imperative, very important. The, it should, we have to identify the natural person who ultimately owns or controls a customer and or the natural person or on whose behalf a transaction is being conducted. It also include those person who exercise ultimate effective control over a legal person or legal arrangement. This is part of recommendation 10. Uh, what is meant by ultimate own and control? The ultimate owns or control and ultimate effective control refers to factual situation in which ownership control is exercised through chain of ownership or by means of control other than direct control. I would suggest everyone here that these go for, to the guidance provided by FATF on the beneficial ownership. This has been extracted from that part, uh, the guidance on transparency and beneficial ownership, uh, October 2014, but this has been recently updated as well. Uh, this is now in place. Uh, the new version is also there. So uh, one can go through it. But these are the two main covenants of it. There is a chain of ownership or it is by means of control other than the direct control. This definition also apply to BO or beneficiary under a life or other investment like insurance policy. So beneficial owner means natural person who, uh, who ultimately owns or control a customer or the natural person or on whose behalf transaction is conducted, a natural person who exercises ultimate effective control over a legal person or legal arrangement. This is now section two, four of Anti-Money Laundering Act 2010 as amended uh, uh, in 2020. So this is the new definition uh, which has come into play into the AML Act. Now the objective is to identify the natural person behind the legal person or legal arrangement. So this is a person who is living, breathing a natural person and he needs to be identified. Now, how is control exercised? Ultimate beneficial owner means a natural person who ultimately own or control a company, whether directly or indirectly, through at least. Now, here we come to the threshold. This threshold is defined by FATF itself. They have also uh, concluded that uh, if you own or control 25%, whether directly, indirectly, jointly, uh, in whatever manner it is, then 25% shares or voting rights or by exercising effective control in that company through other means. So uh, you see, you are either owning directly, indirectly 25% of shares or voting rights, or you are exercising effective control by other means, which means that you can have a, a contractual arrangement, you can have a loan agreement, uh, wherein the the right of appointing majority of board is with you, or there are several other scenarios wherein you can effectively control a company. So whatever the other means through which you are effectively controlling the company, uh, consequently makes you the beneficial owner of the ultimate beneficial owner of the company. So control, uh, control through other means may be exercised through chain of ownership or through close relative or associates having significant influence or control over the finances or decision of the company. This is regulation 19A of the company's general provision form regulation 2018. This has newly been inserted into, the, into these regulation in 2020. 
ultimate beneficial owner means obviously natural. This is the definition given in the limited liability partnership. Here, there is a slight difference, but the meanings are same. Here, the threshold is one fourth of the net profit. As you know, LLP do not have any uh, capital, so it is uh, based on the net profit and losses partnership. Uh, one fourth is equivalent to 25%, and it is the same requirement uh, provided therein, but we have this uh, covenant of direct or indirect rights or who shares at least one fourth of the net profit and losses of a partnership. Now, if we go to the foreign company, it, do, uh, it is uh, mentioned in regulation 29 of foreign companies regulation. It is exactly the same and there's no difference between the local and external regime. It is exactly in the in same language. Threshold is 25%. There is uh, required to be uh, uh, the excising of the effective control. <clears throat> so voting right is uh, mentioned in section 2.1 of uh, uh, section 73 of Companies Act. So in the is voting rights is the right of the member to vote on an agenda item in a journal or extraordinary journal meeting of the company. And effective control in the context of UBA is a term generally understood to refer to a situation in which ownership and or control is exercised through a chain of ownership or by mean of control other than the direct control. This is contained in the fact of guidance on transparency and beneficial ownership. Why does the law provide different UBO definition for companies, foreign companies, LLPs? Although the spirit of the requirement as to how to identify a UBO is the same, the term UBO has been defined differently in different laws and regulation, keeping in view the legal characteristic of that vehicle or entity uh, uh, with which we are dealing. So, uh, for example, LLP has no share capital, therefore definition was customized to the net profit. Now, if we take a few examples of UBO, how can we determine a UBO for, for uh, the, the screen tells you that company two has a shareholder, company one. Uh, and then there is one natural person who is ho who's holding majority share of company one. This means that person indirectly is beneficial owner of company two. Let me move on to a little complex situation here that we have this company A, which is owned 75% by Mr. Khan and 25% by Mr. Company B. Now, Company B is again uh, held by Mr. Raza and Mr. Daud. Uh, so if we see that 25% divided equally, then this means that Raza uh, owns 12.5% and Mr. Daud holds 12.5%. So they do not fall under the definition of PO, but Mr. Khan does. Now, a little more complex situation wherein company Y is owned 20, 20, 20% by E, D, and C company, but uh, in company A and B, it is also held by 20, 20%, and company A and company B is owned by Mr. Khan. So this Mr. Khan is actually the BO of company Y as it crosses the threshold of 25%. Now, if we uh, see that there is a shareholder agreement, then uh, by virtue of shareholder agreement or on company X, if somebody can appoint majority of director or any director who can effectively control the company, then such persons becomes the beneficial owner of the company. Uh, the statutory framework in Pakistan for the beneficial ownership comprises of, as, as we have just scrolled down very various and numerous definitions of PO. They are uh, taken from Anti-Money Laundering Act 2010, Companies Act 2017, Limited Liability Partnership Act 2017, Company Incorporation Regulation 2017, Com Foreign Companies Regulation 2018, uh, Companies General Provision Form Regulation 2018, Limited Liability Partnership Regulation 2018, and SECP Anti-Money Laundering counter terror Financing of Terrorism Regulation 2020. So all these are, are uh, part and parcel of the uh, legislation and these definitions have taken from these uh, laws. What is the rationale of 2020 amendment? We just 
uh, amended our, our Sections and Companies Act uh, in 2020. The rationale behind is to ensure compliance with technical standard of recommendation 24 and effectiveness standard uh, immediate outcome 5 for FATF and enhancing transparency of legal person. It is also to address the concerns, observation raised in countries mutual evaluation report issued by Asia Pacific Group on money laundering in 2019. And we also want to enhance the country's ranking against the four set standards. Now, I want to highlight one important point, which is uh, mostly misunderstood. There are, we have this new section inserted into uh, a Companies Act by the name of Section 123A of the Companies Act. And we already had the Section 452 of Companies Act. This 452 was uh, is the beneficial ownership of the directors. Uh, who are holding certain shareholding in Pakistan and also holding uh, certain shares in outside Pakistan. It is applicable only on such shareholder or director or officer of the company. It is the asset side of the, of the shareholder of the company. While UBO is entirely a different concept, it is the person who is effectively manage or managing more than 25% of share of the company. So uh, by by virtue of the common nomenclature, the in the section 452 and 123A, uh, there can be some misunderstanding, but there is no uh, relationship of two. The UBO is is the ownership side of the uh, uh, of the uh, shareholder and ba beneficial owner, while uh, 452 is only the asset side of the shareholder of any entity or the director or the officer of the company. And it is uh, it was actually promulgated. 452 was promulgated uh, definitely under the Companies Act 2017. It was post Panama that uh, these requirements were brought in uh, so that uh, we can have a global register at SCCP uh, so that uh, we understand that how many of the director or company or the majority shareholder owns the assets outside Pakistan. While in 123A, we are just focusing on who is the ultimate owner of any entity registered in Pakistan. Now, uh, you, as you all know that if there is a parent law, then there is always an explanatory uh, provision in the subsidiary law. This is the subsidiary regulations, which are under the name of Companies General Provision and Form Regulation 2018. We, uh, we have uh, four, um, introduced uh, these five new forms. The first one relates to the bearer share and bearer securities, wherein Pakistan has banned all the bearer security and bearer share, and this pertains to surrender of such uh, shares and uh, warrants, whatever they uh, they are owning. So one, these are the shares to be surrendered by these entities. The next comes to our subject matter, which is PO. Uh, the form 42 is notice to the member for providing particulars of ultimate beneficial. It is exactly the same as like UAE, but the time therein was 60 days. Here we have provided time of 90 days. Three months have been provided to the entities to, co to make compliance with the uh, law. Uh, the law was promulgated on 26th August 2020 and from that point in time one has to comply with the requirement of what, say, form 42 to form 45. Uh, the companies are required to issue notice to the a member. Please note that every member is required to be issued a notice because now at this point in time we do not know that anybody uh, holds indirectly 25% or not. The point to be noted here is that if you if company if company has certain shareholder who are holding less than 25%, still the notice is required to be gone to them. Why? Because you never know that they are jointly owning or they're owning through other means or from indirect means they are controlling a company. So every member is required to be receiving this notice by the company. Then in form 43, they, they are required to declare that they have any beneficial owner or not. In, in this declaration form, <clears throat> they will tell that uh, how much, what, what is their interest in the company. There's a specific form on it, 
very simple form, just like the form we, we saw for the UBO regime of UAE. It's, it's uh, just uh, containing the particulars of name, father name, NIC and other uh, uh, addresses, uh, covenants to that form. Now, as we discussed that as uh, the recommendation 24 requires that information needs to be accurate, which will be submitted in the shape of form 43, but they also require that it should be update. Update means that if there is any change of the ben ultimate beneficial owner or particulars thereof, then such require then such declaration needs to be filed uh, within uh, 30 days of the change of the uh, uh, UBO. Uh, so immediately the uh, the beneficial owner and the main uh, member of the company is required to report to the company that they are going to. Uh, the, the, that there is a change in the ownership or beneficial ownership of the entity. See, FATF allows the countries either to have the this beneficial ownership contained at the uh, maintained at the registry level, the, that is the registrar of companies, he can maintain it, or they also allow that they can be maintained at the uh, at the level of the company. And Pakistan has adopted the approach that the, the information is required to be maintained at the company. They are not required to submit the information to the registry. B but what is required at the registry is a declaration of compliance with the provision of Section 123A of the Companies Act. This is simply a declaration that we have done all the above things, that we have issued notice to the member under Form 42, we have uh, received declaration under 43, and if there is any change, uh, then the declaration about the change of member will be received by them, and on declaration, they will just be uh, telling the SCCP that we have complied with the requirements. The information will not be there. Only the compliance, uh, declaration of compliance will be provided to the SECP. And this information is required to be maintained by the company itself. And they are obliged in two ways. One, they have to tell this information to the competent authority. If there is any investigating agency asking them of this information, they will immediately provide them without any impediment. And secondly, they will uh, cooperate with the financial institutions and DNFPPs that whenever they are going to establish a business relationship with them, the, they are obliged to provide this information of beneficial ownership to the FIs or DNFPP as the case may be. In terms of limited liability partnership, we have only developed three forms. One is declaration by partner about UBO. The other one is declaration by partner about change of beneficial ownership. The first one is the uh, accurate information. And the second one is update of the information. And third one is obviously the, in, the information is required to be maintained by the LLP itself, but only a declaration of compliance is required to be submitted with the registrar of companies. Uh, a, a, a registrar of partnership as the case may be. So this is all what is required in this. So if somebody is not complying with this, uh, LLP or a company is not providing, uh, is not complying with this, or some owner is not, or the shareholder is not complying with it, or the BO is not complying with it, then there are penalties. Uh, in section 512 regarding the foreign companies, the penalty is up to 5 million. Uh, if in case of uh, uh, maintenance of UBA record, section 512 come into play, the penalty is up to 5 million. In case of LLP, section 8 uh, will come into play uh, and it is up to 1 million for the designated partner and 10 million for the LLP. And uh, we have just discussed Another concept, which is global register of PO, uh, therein, if you do not declare your assets outside Pakistan, and you are also holding a certain position in Pakistan in a company uh, by virtue of a significant shareholder or director or officer, then uh, there is uh, imprisonment up to three years uh, for that default. So the uh, we have this uh, FAQs, uh, the link is there. Uh, uh, we have tried to explain everything in the FAQ that how companies are required to maintain and update the information regarding the UPO. And if you are interested, please go on this web go on this website, and you can read these 
question and get further information on this. Thank you very much from my side. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know so that I can answer them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shahzasa. Thank you for a very valuable presentation and sharing your knowledge with the members and students of ICME Pakistan. Can you please stop sharing your presentation? Well, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you very much. On behalf of ICMA Pakistan, I would like to thank the learned speakers, uh, Malik Khalid Mahmood, fellow member of Customer Management Accounts of Pakistan, Mr. Shahzad Afzal Khan, FCMA as well, and uh, to ICMA management, to ICMA employees, those who are providing us the logistic support for the Zoom management and all, and sparing their time at this moment of the time, at, at, during this time of the day, and to, to panelists and to all the attendees, uh, everyone who participated in this program, I hope, I believe that this will be a beneficial for all of us who participated, who attended this program. And if you have any question, you can uh, contact with ICMA Pakistan and uh, you can contact directly with the, uh, the learned speakers as well. Both the presentation can be shared with the participants why ICMA Pakistan, you can contact and you can get this presentation from them because we will be sharing with them, then you can get from them. Thank you very much. And uh, if someone have any question, let me check the question and answer session. If there is anything, uh, Shadal Sahib, you were so marvelous and so explanatory that there is no further question. I believe you have answered all the questions already which are coming in people's mind. So they, they didn't ask any further question from, from your side. So thank you very much. See you at the next event of ICMA Pakistan. Till then, have great time, have great uh, learning as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank thank you sir. Allah. Dear ICM in Pakistan, you may close this meeting now.